Um, a couple housekeeping items before we get started. Um, we will keep you all muted, but if you're joining in, we ask you to remain muted during um, Rebecca's presentation. Uh, if you have comments or questions, please put them in the chat and I will be monitoring that and she will address them at the end of her talk, but we want to make sure that she has the opportunity to fully go through her talk. Um, we also, you know, know that Talking about child trauma is a rough way sometimes to get going in the day. So if you need to get up, turn your video off, stretch, um, you know, please do what you need to do to take care of yourself. Um, and we don't have the capacity in this type of talk to um, field individual questions about, you know, your own child's experience or your own experiences. Um, but if you are in need of some more individualized support, we do have an outpatient clinic um, and we encourage you to reach out to us um, if there are ways that we can support you and your family. Um, so we'll be putting uh, contact information for our clinic into the chat, um, as well as how to sort of follow all of our resources, both on social media and on our website, um, because there's some corresponding blog posts, fact sheets, um, that we have uh, that, you know, help complement some of these talks. Um, and this is all made possible by a federal grant that we have called Metric, um, sponsored by SAMHSA and the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. Um, so that's my whole um, logistical spiel. And I will turn it over to uh, Rebecca's fantastic talk. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, and welcome, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, and get started. All right, Can, is that showing correctly, Alex? Excellent, wonderful. So um, welcome all. Um, today I wanna talk a little bit about what trauma looks like in children, both what kinds of events are traumatic, um, how children may show signs of stress after a traumatic event, and I think most importantly, and often what families are looking for the most, really how parents can support their children after a trauma and how to know when to seek additional support beyond what a parent can reasonably provide. Um, so first, um, I wanna define what we mean when we're talking about trauma. Um, and Sarah noted that we have a, currently have a grant at the Baker Center from the National Child Traumatic Stress Network, which really is the clearinghouse um, for both grants, but also really um, extensive information about childhood traumatic stress. Um, and they define it a little bit differently than um, we talk about it for adults and a little bit differently than clinicians may be familiar with seeing in um, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. We talk about um, a frightening or dangerous event that poses a threat to life or bodily integrity but one of the things that's really unique about children is that their well-being and their life depends on the well-being of their caregivers. So when we're thinking about childhood traumatic stress, we're also thinking about the events that threaten the security of their loved one or the presence of their loved one for them. So that's a little bit different than how we think about it for adults because children are still so reliant on their caregivers that trauma or an event experienced by their caregiver can be experienced by the child as traumatic. Some of the examples we think about, and of course we don't wanna think about any of these things happening to children, but they do. And so when we're thinking about trauma, we're thinking about events that go beyond the scope of kind of daily life stressors. So things like really serious accidents or illnesses that might result in like hospitalization or serious medical attention, violence in the community or in the school, sudden unexpected loss of a loved one. So there we're really looking at the fact that the loss is kind of sudden. All children may experience losses and grief as a result of that, but we think about it moving into the realm of trauma when it's sudden or unexpected or accompanied by another traumatic event like violence. Um, we also think about the experience of children who have seen violence occurring between family members, whether that's between caregivers um, or um, physical abuse of a sibling um, who have experienced and physical that is, um, abuse. Sorry, oh, we're going to keep questions for the end. Thank you. Um, we also think about um, significant neglect or homelessness. 
um, as well as the very extreme events that I think we would all identify as childhood trauma, sexual abuse, or um, children in who are ex directly experiencing events of terrorism. Or and all of these will impact children, um, both in the moment and often in the aftermath of the event. In the moment, we expect all human beings, it's a really evolutionarily adaptive response, are going to have a in-the-moment survival response to danger. That's really important. We want people to have that reaction. That's part of what helps people get through that moment in a safe way. So that often we describe that as flight, fight, flight, freeze. You know, if I run into a bear in the woods, my instinct is either going to be to freeze and stay very, very still and hope it goes away, to run as fast as I can or to try to fight the bear. We think about traumatic events as kind of bear encounters and it is normal and expected that the human body is going to have this kind of hormonally driven survival response in the moment that may look like fight, fight or freeze depending on the situation and depending on the individual. We expect that to happen. We also expect that when the danger goes away, the body will return to some kind of baseline and kind of uh, lose that fight, flight, freeze response. That's an acute in the moment survival mechanism. However, we know that it's not that easy. It's not a switch that gets flipped on and immediately flipped off after the trauma. After a trauma, there are some pretty common kind of lingering responses that we see in kids as well as adults, although today I'm going to focus on reactions we see in kids. These, again, are very common in the few days or even few weeks after a traumatic experience. Kids may get more irritable, more angry, maybe more sad. Kids may have nightmares or kind of think about what happened a lot. You might see either kids sleeping more or having kids sleeping less, eating more or losing their appetite. Um, maybe kind of feeling tired or fatigued, things hurt, I don't feel well, headaches, stomach aches, um, and wanting to stay away from people and places that remind them of the event. This is really protective. If something really scary happened in a specific, excuse me, specific location, it makes sense and is really important that the kid's instinct is actually to stay away from that place in the immediate aftermath. Um, sometimes we see kids who are acting out aggressively, again, right after an event. And this is part of you know, the expected immediate response. We also see slightly different responses depending on the age of the kid. So with little kids, we often see kind of new or a return to separation anxiety, being really clingy, I don't wanna leave mommy. Um, sometimes we see kids going back to earlier behaviors that they may have previously outgrown, like a kid who's toilet trained, suddenly is having accidents again, wetting the bed at night. Um, kids may go back to thumb sucking, kids may go um, back to kind of seeming like they've lost some of their language skills, I mean, going back to baby talk, um, going back to maybe wanting to co-sleep or um, wanting comfort that they, types of comfort that maybe they haven't sought in a really long time. Um, sometimes new fears come up that seem maybe not so connected to the event that occurred itself. So a kid who never needed a nightlight, all of a sudden demanding a nightlight. I'm really scared of the dark. So kind of some of these new fears will, that may come up. They could even be like seemingly really illogical fears that don't really make sense to the adults around them and seem kind of out of the blue. Sometimes we see kids who just become more dysregulated and little kids ex experience and show their dysregulation often through crying and screaming, not necessarily through using words. So sometimes we see kids that are just really tearful, really crying after a traumatic event. And sometimes we see kids playing through kind of stories about trauma in their play. So acting it out with dolls, what happened, acting it out with, you know, um, cars, talking it through in a play setting. That's actually really 
um, an important thing for many kids because play is how they make sense of their experiences. And when a kid is playing it out, sometimes that can be their way of trying to process what occurred. And again, we expect many of these things may come up in the immediate weeks, days and weeks following the trauma. In older kids, it's gonna look different often. Um, we still see some changes in emotional state, kids who become really fearful or sad. But also for kids who are in school, we may say, see that they are having trouble concentrating on schoolwork, maybe not completing schoolwork, forgetting about things, making careless errors, or maybe just refusing to do schoolwork. Sometimes kids' grades will take kind of a dive in the immediate aftermath of a traumatic event. Um, sometimes kids will start getting into trouble at school when they haven't previously been getting into trouble, or they'll space out in the classroom, maybe when that wasn't their normal kind of presentation prior to the traumatic event. Sometimes we have kids who refuse to go to school. Sometimes that can be around not wanting to be away from mom and dad. Sometimes that can be not wanting to kind of, or not feeling able to kind of focus in on academics. So sometimes in the immediate aftermath of a traumatic event, we see some school refusal or some school reluctance behaviors. Sometimes older kids also, um, that irritability and anger can really be disruptive to social relationships. So kids who may be picking fights with their friends or getting into conflict with their friends, um, having a lot of what adults might term kind of drama um, in the aftermath of a traumatic event. Um, and maybe also showing that at home. So increased combativeness, oppositional behavior, defiant, not following rules. Also something we often see in the immediate aftermath of a traumatic event. If there is one thing you take away from what I say today, I think this, this and one other slide are like the two I really wanna highlight. Most kids who experience a traumatic event even if they show some of the signs I just talked about in the days and weeks immediately following, for most kids, those traumatic stress responses will resolve on their own without necessarily going to therapy, without necessarily um, doing something very specific to address the trauma. Kids are incredibly resilient. And most kids who experience a trauma will show some sort of immediate response that will resolve on its own and they will not go on to meet criteria for a clinical diagnosis. They will not go on to have lasting traumatic stress symptoms. And I think it's really important for parents to understand this because it is so understandable that in the immediate aftermath, it, it can be very easy for families to react out of fear and worry about what this means for the trajectory of their child's life. And what I would encourage families to do, and I'm gonna talk about on the next slide, is there are really concrete things that families can do to support kids in the aftermath of a trauma. But I think sometimes in order to regulate the caregiver to be able to help their child, it's important to remember that many children are gonna be going to go on to be okay. And I think that can be really reassuring to hold on to for families. In the immediate aftermath of a trauma, there are many things that families can do that are really important in helping a child's initial symptoms of traumatic stress response to resolve. In fact, one of the biggest predictors of whether a child goes on to experience um, a lasting or diagnosable traumatic stress response is being having a robust, supportive caregiver and social environment around them. There are other factors absolutely that play into which kids develop a traumatic, a lasting response and which kids do not. But one of the big ones is around social and caregiver support. So these are really important things that families and other supportive adults can do. I've I've worked with kids who have experienced traumatic events who will say that in addition to the support they got from mom, that the support they got from their coach was really important or the support they got from their teacher was really important. So I don't wanna limit these things to just parents. 
I think this is something that any supportive adult can do for a child in their life who has experienced a traumatic event. One of the most important things is helping a kid to feel safe. So if there are protective things that can be done to protect the child from uh, the experience that they had, help them feel like they are safe from it occurring again, um, those are incredibly important and incredibly helpful to reestablishing a sense of safety for that child. Um, those are going to look really different depending on what the trauma is. And sometimes with an older child, it may be a conversation with them. What would help you feel safe right now? And then having adults be able to do those things with a younger child, it may be really the parent kind of trying to think through how can we establish this kid's safety so that this is unlikely, as unlikely as possible within our control to happen again. We really want to let kids share their feelings after a trauma, not necessarily pushing them to unpack everything they're feeling. But if a child is starting to express or verbalizing some of their feelings, we really want to be able to be present for that and be able to hear those thoughts and feelings and to hear those as much as possible in a validating way. So there really are no wrong feelings in the aftermath of a traumatic event. Some people tend to be really angry or really sad or really scared or, you know, I've had kids describe their feeling as rage, and we want to make space for a wide range of those feelings and allow a kid to be able to express them. We want to normalize those feelings. Whatever a kid is feeling in the aftermath is probably normal. I think one thing that can get very challenging for family members if they experience the same traumatic event that their child did is that they're reactions and feelings may actually be very different from the child. I've worked with families where maybe a parent is experiencing the trauma, their own trauma response as sadness or grief or loss, and the child is experiencing a high degree of anger. And so being able to hold both that the child's reactions are normal and they're okay for them, and the child needs to know that those reactions are okay, even if, or those feelings are okay, even if they're different from their sibling or from their parent or from other people in the community who may be showing a different response, even to the very same event. Families can really help establish safety and help a kid feel safe by continuing everyday routines and rituals. So if you usually eat dinner as a family, keep eating dinner as a family. If you usually read a story before bedtime, keep reading that story before bedtime. And this goes also for rules and limits, which I think is really hard and sometimes counterintuitive for parents. I'll, I understand it as a parent myself, like I understand the instinct that my kid's been through something hard. They can have as much screen time as they want. They can have ice cream for dinner. You know, I'm not going to make there be rules right now. And rules are part of how kids feel safe. They know what's predictable. They know what's allowed. They know what's not allowed. They feel kind of contained. And so we want to keep those rules and rituals in place for a kid in the aftermath of a trauma so they don't feel like this traumatic event happened and my entire world is different. We want to keep the things that we have control over as much the same as possible. Some things may be out of our control to keep the same. Um, I know I did a training with someone who worked a lot with families after Hurricane Katrina. It's hard to go back to family rituals when your home is gone. But what are the rituals from that that you can still pull and that you can approximate as close as possible to help the child feel whatever level of stability is within your power to ensure in that moment? Increasing positive time, time with important supportive people, time engaged in positive activities, things that the child identifies as positive. We want to help kids reconnect with the supports that they have in their lives so that those feel like they are kind of circling that child and supporting them. And that could be people, that could be places, that could be rituals around religion and prayer, 
that could be hobbies or fun activities that a kid really connects with. We want to help them see that even in the aftermath of a traumatic event, there is a place for happiness and joy and a return to connection and positivity. We want to make sure that parents or caregivers or supportive adults are spending time connecting with that child. Reestablishing the safety of that relationship as another way to hold the child and, and help them feel supported as they move through the aftermath of a traumatic event. And one of the things that's really important to be able to do all of this is to make sure that the parent, that you as a caregiver or parent are getting the support that you need. Because often caregivers went through the same traumatic event that their child did. Perhaps they experienced it differently. Perhaps they're having a somewhat different reaction, but they may be having their own response. And all of this support of your child requires a tremendous amount of energy and ability to manage your own feelings. So, you know, it's a cliche, but, you know, put on your own oxygen mask before helping others, right? You can't help your child through the aftermath if you are so dysregulated and distraught that you can't be present for your child in that moment. And sometimes the most helpful and loving thing a caregiver can do for their child after a trauma is be able to say to their kid, I know I'm having a hard time, but I have people who are helping me. You don't have to be helping me. Um, and so making sure that caregivers are really getting their own support people and rallying their own people um, around them so that they can, can be present for their child is really crucial. Some kids, most kids, these supports, they will move through that traumatic stress response and it will get better on its own. But there are some kids who are going to need additional support. And families often ask, like, well, how do I know? When is it time to reach out for therapy? When is it time to reach out to a clinician or my pediatrician? Um, and my answer would be there's no magic, like, number of days after a traumatic event, but there are some signs that families can look for. If it continues for a long period of time, so we're talking more than a few weeks after the traumatic event, if it seems to be getting worse rather than getting better. So rather than gradually my kid is wetting the bed a little bit less, my kid is a little more willing to go to school, we're heading in the opposite direction, that might be a sign that it's helpful to bring in um, a professional team of some kind. If the traumatic stress responses are safety concerns, so some adolescents may start self-harming or using substances, taking really significant risks. Some kids may become very aggressive. Um, whenever the traumatic stress response includes safety concerns, that's a good reason to say, as a parent, I'm not equipped to handle this on my own. I need some additional support. And the last reason is if a parent just feels like I can't do this on my own, maybe because their own traumatic stress response is preventing them from doing so, or maybe because the behaviors or the re traumatic stress response in their child just feels too much for them to handle, that's a good reason to say, you know what, I'm going to ask for some additional support right now because I need more people on my team. And I think that's a very valid reason to reach out as well. You can reach out by calling a clinic like ours. A lot of people start with their pediatrician because that may be someone you already have a relationship with and that you trust. And a lot of pediatricians offices these days, it's a kind of transition over the last five years, might have a behavioral health person on staff who can help kind of tease out what kind of supports might be a good fit. We know that a lot of pediatricians offices sometimes send kids our way. And there may be kids who see their pediatrician and together with the family decide, you know, let's keep an eye on this, but maybe it's not time for our referral yet. But families are also always welcome to reach out for their own mental health services if they feel like they'd rather bypass the medical office. There's no right way to enter services. A few risk factors that may make it more likely that your kid may need additional support um, is if a child has experienced many traumas or chronic trauma, trauma over a long period of time or repeated traumas. If they were already struggling before the trauma, the trauma may kind 
kind of exacerbate some of the existing concerns. And that may be a reason to kind of maybe a risk factor for uh, a more intense trauma response and maybe a more lasting trauma response. And there are certain kinds of trauma that put kids at higher risk for either meeting criteria for a clinical diagnosis or having a longer term traumatic stress response. And those are some of the ones that happen interpersonally. So uh, forms of abuse, especially sexual trauma. Um, and as I said, one of the best predictors of kids resolving the traumatic stress response on their own is really robust social support. So for kids who maybe for whatever reason don't have as many supports, that can be another kind of risk factor. If you were to bring your child for a trauma assessment at our clinic or at any other kind of outpatient uh, kind of evidence-based clinic, a cl clinician would assess the child by talking to you, by talking to the child, depending on their age. Um, and they're really going to want to understand in assessing trauma response, what was the child like before this happened? What did they experience? And how have has the child's emotions, behavior, thoughts changed since the trauma? So we're really looking at kind of a before and after and what shifts you've noticed in your child over that period of time. And after the assessment, a clinician can make really individualized recommendations of what kinds of treatment might be helpful. Um, because there are actually a lot of evidence-based trauma treatments that take slightly different approaches. Um, the National Child Traumatic Stress Network, which I mentioned earlier and is an incredible resource, um, has information sheets about many of the evidence-based uh, child trauma treatment options. So if you were to go to a clinic and they were to say, oh, this is the approach that we take, you could go to NCTSN and look for a fact sheet to learn a little bit more about this approach to trauma treatment, as well as if you were interested, it will tell you kind of what is the research basis for this. Um, so it can be a way to kind of unpack the acronyms an alphabet soup that sometimes families can be faced with when they're seeking a specific treatment model. Um, there are differences between the different models. Sometimes it's about age of the child. There are some very specific young child trauma treatments. Sometimes it's a little bit about the type of approach or the setting in which the treatment might be occurring. Um, one thing they all really have in common is that they're trying to reduce those traumatic stress symptoms that I talked about and increase coping skills and adaptive healthy responses. And many of the child trauma treatments across different intervention models will incorporate caregiver support because we know that that's a huge predictor of children's uh, coping, children's resilient responses, and also we know that treatment is gonna end at some point and that the caregiver is gonna be the one who's present to help the child if they hit any bumps in the road after treatment ends. We wanna make sure that that caregiver is equipped to be able to do so. So there's often a, a robust caregiver involvement component in many of the evidence-based treatment models. It's not always required. And there are some kids for whom caregiver involvement is either not appropriate or there isn't an appropriate person to be involved but often it's a very key component for many, many kids. I'm gonna talk specifically about one trauma, uh, one evidence-based trauma treatment approach that we do here at the Baker Center and that I've done for many years, um, which is trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy. Used for short, we use TFCBT. Um, it is the most broadly researched and has one of the strongest evidence bases of any of the child traumatic stress treatments um, that have that, that that exist. So it is often one that you will hear at, referenced at many different clinics in many different settings. It's been used all over the world um, and with many different populations, different types of trauma. Um, very, very well supported. So this is one that I feel like if families are only going to hear one acronym, this is probably the one they're going to hear. Um, it's been researched in many different places, very high quality research studies, 
we have a lot of evidence to show that this is very, very effective. Um, it is based in kind of certain model modules of skills that our kids are taught in a specific order in order to build self-regulation skills. Um, but just because it has those modules doesn't mean that it's not flexible. The clinician can still really individualize it, make it work for this specific kid, their specific personality, temperament, engagement style, interests. Um, but it is going through kind of very specific skills that we know are helpful to children after a trauma and helpful to resolving traumatic stress responses. And it does involve a supportive caregiver, usually a caregiver, sometimes another supportive adult to be there and be present for the child and support their treatment um, throughout the process. The goals of TFCBT, which are similar to many of the other child trauma treatment models, are to improve family relationships. Sometimes trauma can really rupture relationships in a family, maybe because there's conflict, maybe because there's disagreement, maybe because a kid's traumatic response is anger and that anger is really getting in the way, um, or maybe just because the trauma becomes this thing we don't talk about. And then there's just this kind of elephant in the room. And so we want to use TFCBT as a way to bring kind of repair and healing to those relationships. We want to help a kid be able to cope with the reminders of the trauma that they might encounter. Um, sometimes we try to avoid trauma reminders and it's not possible. Um, and so how do we help a kid be able to move through their world, not focused on avoidance of trauma reminders, but knowing that they can cope with them when they encounter them. TFCBT really focuses on developing self-regulation, both emotionally, cognitively, and behaviorally, and reducing trauma symptoms that they may be experiencing and figure out ways to keep themselves safe moving into the future. TFCBT, again, kind of goes through a process in a specific order. We want kids and families to understand what is traumatic stress and why is the child kind of feeling in these ways. Sometimes kids don't even connect their changes in feelings or behaviors to the trauma and may not understand why am I so angry or why am I having trouble sleeping or why am I having a big response when a teacher taps me on the shoulder at school. So helping to understand what's going on um, can be so important in helping to normalize it and helping a child to feel um, that there isn't something wrong with them. There's just, this is their body responding to an event that happened and we're gonna help you through this. The clinician that helps the child kind of build and practice self-regulation skills before moving into gradually starting to have to talk about the trauma and to support gradual exposure to trauma memories. And I'll talk a little bit about why we do that in a second. We want the child to help the child develop a healthy, adaptive understanding of their trauma experience to make some kind of meaning of this. Um, even when there may not be clear explanation of why it happened, how does the child understand how this trauma fits into their story? And we want to support the child in being able to talk to their caregiver about what they experienced. And again, part of that is wanting to allow for dialogue and allow for support so that after the treatment terminates, the child has the support that they need moving forward in that kind of natural relationship and isn't um, seeing the therapist as the only supportive person. We want to make sure we're really building up the caregiver. One of the things people worry the most about with TFCBT and with trauma treatment in general is, oh my gosh, talking about it is going to make it so much worse. Let's just, let's just stop talking about it and it'll go away. There's a lot of research to show that if only it were so, but it isn't. That trauma doesn't disappear. Trauma, tra traumatic stress responses don't disappear if we ignore them. Kids have their trauma memories with them every day. And if they're showing a traumatic stress response, what that tells us is that the trauma is continuing to affect them and that they actually aren't able to ignore it. 
that it's coming in in all these places that they don't want it to, and it's interfering with their life. And so in order to um, help them, we have to be able to talk about that. We know that talking about trauma and the traumatic experience in treatment helps children learn how to manage their memories, learn how to manage their reminders, and develop a sense of control. So instead of feeling like, I never know when my trauma is going to resurface, they feel like, I feel prepared. I know how to handle these things when they come up. And the child learns that the memories can't hurt them, that the experience itself may have been very dangerous, very scary, and even hurtful, but that the memories of that experience are not dangerous. Because one of the things we know about tra traumatic stress is that the child is actually having a survival, they're going back to that fight or flight response in reaction to their memories. And so we want to help differentiate that. The experience, you needed fight or flight. Your memories are actually a safe experience to have. Treatment helps a child learn to manage their distress. And we are doing this in a very thoughtful and controlled way in TFCBT. We're exposing the child to their trauma memories very gradually in a place that is safe and after they already have coping skills. So we are not overwhelming the child, putting the child in dangerous situations. We are doing this very intentionally and thoughtfully to help them gain mastery over their memories. And there are two metaphors I always use with families. One is this closet, right? Sometimes after a traumatic stress response, the temptation, it's kind of like this messy closet. And the temptation is, let me just slam the door on that closet and not even look at the mess because I don't want to deal with it. It's too, it's too overwhelming. But what we know, or at least what's true of my closet, is if I do that for too long, the door is going to pop open and things are going to start falling on, on my head. Or maybe I have to open that door for some reason and all of a sudden it's overwhelming and chaotic and I, I can't deal with it. So trauma treatment is like slowly taking out everything from that closet, folding it up and putting it back in its place so that it's less overwhelming and it doesn't kind of pop out when I don't want it to or when I'm not ready for it. The other metaphor I often use is a wound or a cut because all the kids I've worked with have had the experience of skinning their knee at the playground or getting a paper cut. And often how I explain trauma treatment is, I know you when you skin your knee, you probably just want to ignore it, pretend you didn't, and just like go about your day. And that's often actually that, you know, sometimes that works. But sometimes when it's a really deep cut or it's a really painful cut, if you just ignore it, it's going to get infected. And traumatic stress response is showing us that there's an infected cut here. And what we need to do is we need to really gently and little bit by little bit in a very careful way wash out that cut, clean it out, and then cover it up so that it can heal. And so what we're doing in trauma treatment is we're washing out that wound in a really careful way. It might hurt a little, it might be hard work, but all of this is gonna help us so that it's able to heal and we're able to kind of allow you to move forward with your life without this like big infected cut that's really bothering you. I also like this metaphor because sometimes I talk with kids about how your trauma, you know, there may be a scar there after you skin your knee. Like there may always be a little place where you can kind of see how the trauma affected you, but we want to help it be, you know, uh, something that doesn't hurt the same way it used to, that allows you to move forward in, in your life. There, we do TFCBT at the Baker Center. We also do a group based trauma treatment, which is also an option. This is very similar in many ways to TFCBT, but it's conducted in a group. It was originally piloted in schools, so the name has schools in it, but it can be done at clinics like ours as well. Um, it follows the same kind of core ideas. Um, before kids join the group, they're always screened by a clinician so that we can make sure we're putting together a group of kids that's appropriate, that makes sense, that's going to be a good fit for, 
for each child to be in a group setting. But they don't all have to have exactly the same traumatic experience. Children learn about trauma and they learn about self-regulation and they practice self-regulation as a group. But the gradual exposure to trauma memories of the individual child happens outside the group with an individual clinician. So child, the child is not going into deep, detailed explanations of what happened to them in the group setting. They may give, they will give a little bit of information, but the more trauma, the more gradual exposure is happening individually. One of the nice things about a group setting for trauma work is that it can really normalize. I'm not the only kid who's been through something hard, and I'm not the only kid who's struggling after something. One of the things that happens after trauma is often kids feel very different from their peers and very isolated from their peers. And doing trauma treatment in a group setting in this way can decrease some of that isolation, help kids feel like, oh, I'm not the only one who needs some of these regulation skills or coping strategies. And I'm not the only kid who's been through hard stuff. We are running CBITS this summer. Um, if you want more information, the website for more information about CBITS is at the bottom of this slide, but there will be both a summer group and a fall group at our Waltham location facilitated by our really experienced trauma clinicians. If this seems like something that could be a good fit, please feel free to reach out and we would guide you through what that process could look like. Additional resources for people who are interested in learning more I cannot recommend the National Child Traumatic Stress Network highly enough. Their website is a wealth of information for caregivers, schools, clinicians, um, even fact sheets that are meant to be child facing. Um, so tons of information there. My slides about kind of age related reactions to trauma come from a couple of handouts, but predominantly from one from NCTSN that you can reference. It's, it's a nice one pager, which can be useful um, if you want to share with extended family members or with clients. Um, there's a wonderful handout for caregivers on helping children cope after trauma, um, which is a resource I use frequently. And I think, again, can be a really helpful one pager to explain to uh, people kind of what they can do to support. And if you want more information about either TFCBT or CBITS, the NCTSN fact sheets are a great place to start. If therapists are interested in more training in TFCBT, I did include the training websites at the bottom. Um, there is a whole process of how you become kind of certified in TF, and um, all of that information would be at this website. So I'm going to wrap it there and turn it over to Sarah to kind of let me know what questions I might be having from the group. I am going to stop sharing since you don't need to do that. Thank you for such a wonderful and helpful and informative talk. Um, I actually didn't get any questions in the chat, so we will open it up. You can unmute yourselves. I think you're just such a captivating speaker, Becca. I loved the metaphors that you used and how specifically you described exactly what a good trauma treatment would entail and also some really hopeful messages in a, uh, you know, sort of sometimes difficult topic. So um, what questions do folks in the room have? Hi, my name is Kelly French and I'm the mom of two adopted boys that were exposed to opioids in utero. So we're always trying to define what trauma means to them and how we can get them help. And most recently um, I was on a mom's group call and someone was talking about not calling trauma, not calling oppositional defiance disorder, ODD, but calling it trauma. Do you have any insight on what that means, ODD versus trauma, or is is ODD going away and trauma is the new the new word? Well, I think it's important to distinguish that while oppositional behaviors can certainly arise after a trauma and be part of a traumatic stress response. Not every child who is showing a pattern of oppositional behavior necessarily has a trauma history. So I think a really robust assessment, really individualized assessment is really important to distinguish kind of what is the root of 
the oppositional or the defiant or the angry, challenging behaviors that a kid might be showing. For some kids, that very much could be rooted in a trauma. And for other kids, it might not be. There might be another explanation or other factors at play. So I think, I mean, my answer would really be there isn't a one size fits all. But I do think that understanding kind of the range of trauma responses um, that someone can have and that some of those can look pretty, pretty angry or pretty oppositional. So I would say that it really is about getting a very thorough and robust uh, clinical assessment to start to tease out some of those different factors that may be at play for an individual kid. I don't know that I can make a sweeping statement there. And Sarah, if you have anything to add, please feel free. Thank you. We have a question. Should we always wait to see signs of trauma? I have a 17 year old nephew who has Asperger's and possible OCD. His mom suffers with poor mental health and alcohol abuse. I, I'm worried this has become his new normal and he's masking. Um, he now defends her behavior at times. You know, I think um, there are kids who can really hide their traumatic response. And I do think it's a little trickier to assess the impact of trauma when trauma has been going on for many, many years, right? I talked about in a good, thorough trauma assessment, we're looking at what was a child like prior to the trauma, what was what happened and what was a child's kind of changes in behavioral presentation or emotional presentation. That's really tricky when there isn't a clear event and there isn't a clear before and after. Sometimes there is. And also there are kids like you describe where the experience of trauma has been more chronic over a period of time. Trauma treatment is still, um, there's a lot of research to show that trauma treatments are effective for chronic experience of trauma, multiple event or kind of chronic over time. So I think treatments can be very effective, but I think the assessment can be a little bit trickier because it's a little harder to kind of understand what's a result of the trauma. I think you bring up a good point, which is that, you know, sometimes kids kind of hide it and sometimes also chronic kind of acclimatize to chronic trauma. I think it may be, you know, a case of seeking some extra support and Sometimes seeking extra support leads in the direction of let's get a really good evidence-based trauma intervention in place. And sometimes seeking additional support can provide reassurance that that actually isn't what's needed right now. So I tend to be as a clinician, all of my clients know that I say this, um, I tend to be of the feeling that more information allows you to make more informed decisions and that there is often not a, you know, individual cases and exceptions do exist, but there's often not a reason to not seek more information because it at least allows you to kind of think it through in a more nuanced way and to have kind of more eyes, more heads, more perspectives. And then, you know, a caregiver can feel like they're making the best decision for their child or for their loved one. You know, I'm just thinking about the two, the last two questions about, about the ODD and like, when should we seek help? You know, when should we not? And also some of the data that you said about the one supportive caregiver and how, how helpful that is in promoting resilience. And, you know, in the mental health field, unfortunately, we have sort of an illness orientation to the work that we do, where we're all often waiting for something bad to happen or bad symptoms uh, before we sort of intervene. And that's where I think a lot of the um, sort of caregiver-based interventions can be really useful. If you have a kid who's like maybe pre-symptomatic or you think this is just sort of their normal um, or even you know things like maybe they've been diagnosed with something like oppositional defiant disorder and it's manifesting as behavioral challenges. One of the nice things is that a parent-based or caregiver-based intervention is often one of the frontline treatments to support kids who've had a broad range of experiences. It's never gonna be harmful. It's only gonna help in, in enhance caregiver skills, solidify those really strong relationships and be really trauma informed. So even if it's like, is it ODD? Is it a traumatic stressor disorder? 
Is it, you know, dealing with the caregiver who has their own, um, you know, challenges that just make life a little more difficult? Um, it, it helping caregivers have a uniform set of skills and a way to positively respond to their child is going to be a frontline and preventative intervention. Um, so we offer something here at the Center for Effective Therapy called Behavioral Parent Coaching, um, which is exactly that approach and that's offered elsewhere as well. Um, so that can even be a good entryway into the field to just get some new skills, new strategies and some support. And then sometimes as we're in treatment and we're you know, sort of getting deeper into things, more stuff becomes available. You know, Kids start to share more and more when that you know, caregiver relationship is enhanced and strengthened, and then we can get into more targeted trauma work. Um, but that sort of trauma informed, um, you know, uh, starting point can be really beneficial for a lot of families. I think that's such a good point, Sarah, that so much of what I want folks to take away from today is that caregiver support and connection is really, really crucial for kids in the aftermath of trauma and that there's so much that caregivers can do. And sometimes in order to be that supportive person to your child, you need people in your corner helping you figure out how to do that work, how to be that supportive person and giving you skills to kind of maybe support in ways that may not feel totally intuitive to you initially. Um, so I think that that's where seeking support for yourself as a caregiver is really, really important, right? As a, you know, whether you're a parent, an adopt, a biological parent, an adoptive parent, a caring aunt, um, thinking about how do you get that support? And one of the ways can be through a, a parent coaching um, or um, other kind of parent or caregiver focused intervention that allows the caregiver to then be more present and supportive and connected to their child. We have another really great question um, asking about how TFCBT addresses problems like dissociation, memory recovery, and processing. That is, uh, yes, absolutely. I think that we start with, often dissociation is a, a protective response, right? This is someone who is so overwhelmed that it's too scary to approach those memories. And so often what I've seen in my experience, and we have some other TF practitioners uh, here who can speak to their experiences as well, is that these are kids who really have very few self-regulation and coping skills. And so dissociation kind of has become kind of what needs to happen. And so as we start to build, help kids first understand that dissociation is a protective response that their brain is having right now and then build up their skills in being able to manage non-trauma related emotions at first um, and, and have more coping strategies and have more ways to self-regulate, then slowly we're able to move again, gradually with coping skills and in safety towards those traumatic memories and dissociation is no longer um, their only a way to manage those feelings in that moment. And so it becomes uh, less frequent, it becomes less intense, and gradually, you know, we can work in that direction. But that is why it is so important that we are never going straight for the gradual exposure to trauma memories before a child has built up alternative healthy ways of coping. Um, so that when we get to those memories, the child has kind of a way to manage that we're getting there and to maintain safety. And we're doing it in very small increments. And there are some kids who need it to be very slow. And the clinician is really working carefully to pace to what the child is ready for and able to tolerate. So perhaps our last question, um, and this is a astute question. Um, so some trauma response symptoms overlap with other diagnoses like ADHD. Um, what are ways at the assessment level to address, um, you know, differentiating between trauma and avoiding misdiagnosis? Absolutely. And that's where I think having, uh, and taking it maybe that this is a question from a clinician, um, I think that sometimes when we're talking about an event trauma, the timeline can be a really helpful place to gather a lot of information, which of these symptoms may have existed prior to when traumatic events began. 
and which of these symptoms really emerged in the aftermath. And sometimes we don't know exactly the timeline of trauma or trauma started when a child was very, very young. That may be very hard to sort out, but sometimes that can be helpful because we know that a child who all, who was already showing or who already met criteria for a diagnosis of ADHD can experience trauma and have a traumatic stress response. We also know that a child who maybe wasn't having challenges with behavior or wasn't having challenges with attention in the aftermath of a traumatic event, a traumatic stress response could include decreased attention, could include trouble with concentration or impulsive uh, acting out behaviors. So I think timeline is a really important piece of it. I also think um, for many, while the while I don't want to remotely have this be taken as downplaying the importance of thoughtful and accurate diagnosis, I do want to kind of speak to Sarah's point earlier that for many uh, diagnoses uh, other than trauma, some of the frontline interventions are actually also very appropriate for a child who has experienced trauma. So some of the parenting interventions while I would want to be as thoughtful as possible to understand as best I can, whether these kind of behaviors are arising from trauma or from something else, the way I address them in treatment might not be dramatically different, um, where I'm going to really work on caregiver connection. I'm going to really work on positive responses. I'm going to really work on consistency of support. All of those things I would be doing, whether my diagnosis was a trauma-related diagnosis or another diagnosis. So sometimes I think that while the diagnostic framework is really helpful, some of these treatments are response and behavior driven um, and cross diagnostic categories to some degree. Awesome. Well, thank you for a fantastic talk. I definitely learned some great things and the way that you explained it was so clear um, and really actionable for many of us. So hopefully it was helpful for all those in the crowd as well. Thank you for your questions and making this, you know, a lively and active discussion. And thanks for the team for putting on this event. Please let us know if there's other types of talks that you'd like to see featured in the future or any other type of feedback that you have for us and have a good rest of your day. Hopefully the sun starts to poke out for those who are in the Boston area. So um, thank you so much.